Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you on this lovely, snowy day. It's New England. And I guess the groundhog was prophetic. It said six more weeks. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, we had 60 degrees of weather. But now, of course, it seems that the groundhog is indeed prophetic. <laughs> well, it's so good to see everyone here this morning. And, and for those that are watching live, uh, live stream, great to see you. We have a new platform, everybody. It's, it's a lot more interactive. Let me just tell you what's going on. If you go to cornerstonecheshire.com, you click on it. It comes up, and you can, like, type prayer concerns in there. You can respond. You can raise your hand in church. I mean, it's cool things like that. And so we're looking for some folks that want to, we're going to put a computer in the back there, and someone can stay there the whole time and manage it and, you know, deal with prayer concerns, live stream. And so we had, like, 85 people that were on that platform last. Plus, we're on Facebook Live. So we just started doing the Facebook Live is not as an interactive as our site, but it's a great place to invite folks. Hey, come and be a part of the church and just invite them, especially today when most churches are canceled today and all that. Also, I want everyone to know that we're supposed to have a healing service tonight with Raymond Mui, uh, but the problem, the challenge is he's coming from my friend's church, uh, Pastor Glenn Harbison in Greenwich, and uh, from my, they had to cancel all the service. They had ice. If it was ice, we canceled too. They had complete ice over everything. So I said, well, we'll see what happens. Right now, it looks like it's going to be canceled, but if the weather turns, we'll still have them. I hate to miss them, but that's what's happening with that, okay? So today, we're beginning a new series. It's called Hot Love, and I know the title may be a little bit, whoa, what's that all about? Well, really, if you think about it, God is the creator of all relationships. God's the one that designed love. He made love. He made marriage, and, and because of that, he has the best, and I'm quote unquote, hottest love around. It's from God. And so what has happened is the, the world or the enemy's taken that and they perverted what God would want and they've marketed it and made it in a way that instead of being a pro productive, life giving attribute in our society, it's become a drainer in society. It's, it become a, a, creates all kinds of pain for people. And so, really, one of the most important things that we do in life, really, is relationships. And the relationship between a man and a woman is huge. It's being distorted today like never before. And so, what this is all about, becoming more attractive today, it'll be a six-week series I want to get into. But I want to say something else about, about God and about love. How many like spaghetti? Okay, good. There we go. You ever have a spaghetti strainer? You know what it looks like? A metal or plastic thing that's got a bunch of holes in it. And so, what you do is you get this pasta, you pour it in, and all the water comes out. Now, I want you to imagine, if you, if you will with me, if we could put, God is love, right? God is complete, pure love. Imagine putting a spaghetti, uh, spaghetti strainer to the sky, and imagine every one of those points, those little holes in that spaghetti strainer represents a different facet of human love, what we experience. For example, a love between a parent and a child, a love between a husband and wife, a father's love, a mother's love, a love for an animal, a love for a dog, even a love for a cat, okay? All these different holes, and imagine each of those holes represent that facet of love. Now, all love comes from God because God does, is not, God does not give love. He is love. God personifies love. Love expresses Jesus Christ on the earth, come dying for us. So God is complete, perfect love in every attribute. And so what has happened is the enemy tries to throw junk on the spaghetti strainer, if you will, and tries to pollute what comes down to us. And so what we want to do is we want to restore and help us to understand what true love is in a relationship. Because make no mistake about it, relationships are the most attacked today. In fact, 40% of people right here, right now, according to statistics of free Pew Research, would say this, 40% of people right now are either involved in a bad marriage or are affected by one. 40%. And 25% of couples today, 25% are on the brink of wondering, should I file or should I not? I mean, it's to the point where you're ready to walk. 25%. So make no mistake, relationships are in crisis today. And so God has a lot to say about relationships because really, if you think about it, if your relationships, if your relationships are healthy, life is healthy. God is all about relationships. So we're going to be looking through the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon was written by Solomon. 
Solomon was called the wisest man that ever was on the face of the earth. He was the third king of Israel. And it was David's son. Uh, and God, even though David messed up royally, <laughs> pun intended, God still redeemed him because of his repentant heart. And we end up having a child with Bathsheba called Solomon, the second child that they had. The first one died. And Solomon was dedicated to the Lord. He was the wisest man that ever was. The Bible said he was extremely wise. He was very successful, very wealthy. He began his, he began his uh, career very successfully. In fact, not only that, but he also wrote three books in the Bible. Proverbs, he wrote most of the Proverbs, not all, but most of them. Very wise sayings of the book. He also wrote Ecclesiastes towards the latter part of his life. And the Song of Solomon, and really it should be called the Song of Songs. Because out of all his works, he considered, and people considered this as his greatest. This is the cream of the crop. The Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. And it, it's there, he probably wrote it in the early part of his life. Uh, just to let you know, Solomon didn't end well. I mean, he, he might have ended well, but he went off, he veered off course for a period of time. But he started off really, really good. And what he does here is he expresses and talks about love relationships and how they're supposed to function. And I don't know about you, but I think we need to be reminded of the right way to interact with each other. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're young, whether you're mature, whatever it is, we don't say old, you're mature, uh, there's something for everybody. I want to encourage you today, if you will take the next six weeks and really lean into this, lean, lean into this and invest in your relationships, I guarantee you that all of us are going to be better as a result of this. Why? Because it's the Word of God. All right? So we're going to look at the Song of Solomon. Let me say something else about the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is, is an allegory. It's poetic. But many people in the church have made it just, they say, oh, it's about, it's about Christ and his church. Let me, let me just go ahead. If you, you could just give me a moment to give you a little seminary training that I learned, okay? When we learn biblical interpretation, one of the things you have to do is you have to go back to the original source and look at the original audience. Who was it written for? Okay, that's important. And so when you look at the Song of Solomon, it was written for, written for his contemporaries, and unmistakably, it was written between the love of a man and a woman in a romantic fashion. It's a wonderful poetry about love between a man and a woman. Now, can it mean Christ and his church? Yeah, I believe so. The Bible says everything written is a shadow and a type. So when you look at Moses and you look at all things in the New Te Old Testament, it's a shadow and type of what Christ begins, what does. But it would be a mistake to look at that exclusively as Christ in the church. It's, not, it's really between a man and a woman. Can you take it and learn from that? Absolutely. And there are my friends that believe in that, and that's great. But we're going to really take it from what it, I believe and what other people would believe would be the case. Well, let me tell you another reason why. Uh, the church historically had walked away from this, especially in the, in the Middle Ages. The reason was people, the church used to view sexual intimacy as dirty and wrong, and they were embarrassed about it. They don't want to talk about that. Oh, the, the Bible can't be about that. Let's make an allegory. You see, and, and if you can do that to scriptures, that's not good. It's not good biblical interpretation. So you understand what I'm trying to say? It's always good to go back to the original source, read it within the context it has, Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and understand that the Bible is so, so incredible that God can take a historical story and make it a type and a shadow of what is supposed to be in the New Testament. The Bible even says all the things in the Old Testament are allegory. It can be used as teaching points for what's happened. God will make historical things happen. So I hope you understand that, everybody. And this is a poetic thing, okay? So we're going to look at it. So... The Song of Solomons. There, uh, the basically, Song of Songs, there are three main groups throughout this, throughout this work to help you understand. The first one is Solomon. He's the lover. That's the king. Then you have the woman, beloved. She speaks. And then you have the daughters of Jerusalem, like this chorus of friends that will kind of chime in. Oh, yeah, he's great. They'll kind of agree with what he is saying or she is saying. You know, it tells me a couple of things, by the way. It tells me partially that our relationships should not be in a vacuum that knowing each other 
blessing each other that you know our relationship should really be influenced by our friends that we should encourage each other in our relationships and that's exactly what's happening here they're encouraging their relationship they're affirming what's going on do you have anyone affirming your relationship in a positive way that's why we have small groups partially you know you should be connected we're not supposed to be silos all by ourselves we should be connected and so this kind of talks about that by the way that community aspect but let's go ahead and look at what it has to say I'm going to look at uh, just some examples from chapters 4 and 7 and, and just to show you how it is an allegory. And, and it's hard to understand because we don't speak this way today. And so I'm going to have to do the hard work for you to understand what they mean, okay? So let's look at some examples of what we're going to read through this. How beautiful you are, my beloved, you are. Your eyes are like doves. He's speaking about the girl. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil, the king. Your hair... It's like a flock of goats. Can you imagine telling your wife, a girlfriend, honey, you're hot. You're, your hair is like a flock of goats. I mean, you probably would not be treated very well. Okay, a flock of goats, a flock of goats. You know, a flock of goats. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes and little lambs. Uh, your teeth. Okay. Your lips are like scarlet thread. That's okay. We're okay with that one. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranates. All right. Okay. I'd probably say pepperoni pizza, but anyhow. <laughs> Your neck is like a tower of David built upon rows of stones on which are hung a thousand shields. In other words, you got a long neck. Okay. And we move on. Young ones. Your two breasts are like two fawn, little deers, twins of gazelles which feed among the lilies. Your lips, my bride, drip honey and milk are under your tongue. Now, obviously, we don't talk this way. Look at the rest of this here. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. I don't think Lebanon smells very good. Now, this is my favorite. Your belly is like a six pack. No? Your. <laughs> Your belly, like a heap of wheat. And this is another. Your nose is like a tower. You got a big honking nose, girl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which faces towards Damascus. Now, that's pretty amazing. Now, if we were to take this literally, she would look something like this. <laughs> Here's your flock of goats. There's some pomegranates for our temples. Uh, we got birds in her eyes. Uh, we got the tower. Uh, uh, we got the tower over here. This is going toward Damascus. We have the two fawns. Uh, we won't go there. Anyhow, but obviously that's not what we're talking about, right, everybody? But the language of his day that was considered like, wow, that's romantic. This is why it's important to understand the culture and understand when we're reading what we're reading. Okay, let's move forward here. Now, let, let me just give you a little outline of what we're going to be doing. I plan this out for the next six weeks, and this is what we're going to be doing today. We're talking about attraction. How you can become more attractive. We have Mary Kay outside. We have facials outside and mud masks. No, I'm just kidding. We're not talking about that kind of attractiveness. But we have attraction. What makes you attractive? I think all of us should be, try to be more attractive, right? Catch today. Week two, this is for the younger folks and all of us, dating. How are you supposed to date? Uh, what does the Bible say about dating? That's next week. And then the third week, February 26th, is the spicy one. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about intimacy and marriage. Yes, we're going to talk about sex. And guys and girls and young boys and girls and everyone else, guess who designed sex? God. God made it. We have distorted it. It is one of the most beautiful things that can help bring relationship together and create life. It can also create havoc and difficulty like nothing else. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there about that, incidentally. In fact, just to give you an example... If you watch TV alone, just television, television alone, they've done, uh, they've done research on this, 90% of all sexual um, discussions or activities that are on television are people that are not married. That's just television. Let me say something else about the series. Uh, this one is going to be PG-13. In other words, if you don't feel comfortable having your kids here, we're going to talk about how to have a great... Um, sex life according to God. That's, that's on the 26th. 
and, and I hear the men. No, I'm just kidding. But that's going to be, and it's going to be PG-13, a little spicy, but I guarantee you we're going to be respectful because it's got, you know, we got to talk about this thing. You want to hear about it on television? Do you want to hear about it in the break room? Do you want to hear about it with the guys or with the girls? Do you want to hear about it in some movies that are real popular right now in our culture talking about what good love is? Absolutely not. The church should be the place where we talk about this. Why? Because God is the author and the completer of our faith. He's the maker of all love. He designed love. He made love. He designed man and woman. He designed relationships. Well, we need to talk about this in the proper context because it, it, it messes us up. So that's week three. And then week four, by the way, this is how the, the, the book of uh, Solomon goes around. They're dating here. Uh, they get married. And then after they get married and all the loving things go away, they have conflict. They fight for two chapters. All right? Now we're getting their real life, right? They fight for two. How to deal with conflict? Listen, you can't stop it. Conflict's going to happen. How do you deal with conflict? We'll talk about it, okay? And then they get through their conflict. Now they're learning how to deepen their love. How do you deep your love? Okay? And we talk about that. And then finally, something we don't hear a lot about today, and that's covenant relationships, faithfulness. That means not giving up. I mean, I, I'm not going to give up on you. I, you know, as my mother, as people often said, I'll never divorce my spouse. I might murder him, but I'll never divorce him. Okay, I'm not suggesting you do that either. But just to say, I won't, um, the D word is not even an option for us. We're going to make this work. Somehow, some way, we're going to make this work. And so, my friends, if you lean into these six weeks, I guarantee you, not because of Eric Bucci, but because of the Word of God is stronger. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. God uses His Word to bring us health, and this is what it's going to be about, okay? So let's break into it. We're going to chapter 1, verse by verse, line by line a little bit here. And, uh, and just to let you know, I use different versions that will express it better, but I do look at the originals to let you know, okay? Here we go. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. This is her speaking. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than grape juice. I'm sorry. Your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, the virgins love you. She's basically saying, hey, man, you are such a good-looking guy that all the girls think you're it. All right? And any, any man likes to hear that. And so she's like talking them up. All right, you are incredible. She's like saying, oh, I want to see God made this. And so it's a beautiful thing, relationship. So we move on. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. And you talk about how everyone just thinks this guy's awesome and he's mine. And she's just a delighting in her, her man. We move forward. Draw me away. We will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly, they do love you. And she's just, just talking up her man. Oh, I just love the king. He's amazing. My husband is amazing. Well, the man I love, actually. They're not married yet, okay? Here we move forward. And then we get to something, our first point for today is this. I am dark but lovely. All daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, where the tents of Kedar would be completely black, okay? Like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. L let me explain. Uh, tanning salons in the day of Solomon would be out of business. Because if, if you were tanned, that meant you were out in the fields working, and you get all tanned. If your hands were full of calluses, you're a working woman. You know, you know, you're not the dainty little cover girl we like to talk about. You know, she's tan. She's been out in the sun too much. And in other words, she's saying, "Don't look at me. Don't look at me because of my looks. Look at who I am." You see, I want to encourage everyone. The law of attraction. Don't just look at the outside. Start with the more important one, the inside. Because you know what? The outside's a moving target. <laughs> I have to tell you. I don't know if you noticed this, but I have found that the older I get, the more things, well, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, things don't stay the same, do they, everybody? Absolutely not. Beauty is fading, right? Beauty's fading. Doesn't mean we don't pay attention to it. 
But that's not the main thing. So do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun is tanning my skin. So she's not the upper echelon. This is a working woman. She, you know, she's out there in the fields, and she's not sitting there under, staying out of the sunlight. She doesn't have a cloak over her face. She's not trying to avoid the sun coming in. She is out in the fields. She says, but I am dark but lovely, uh, um, and do not look upon me because I'm dark. And, oh, hey, listen, you know, I know I may be dark, but he loves me just the way I am. He doesn't look at the uh, superficial. He sees beyond the superficial. And my friends, true love sees beyond the the superficial and sees what lasts forever because beauty is fading make no mistake it is absolutely fading and here we go on my mother's sons were angry with me they made me the keeper of the vineyards so basically what was happening was she had some family trouble they weren't treating her very well she's out in the fields hey you get out there young lady no you're not we're not going to treat you like a, a lady you get out there and work she's working a hard day's night and she's not sleeping like a log, right? And, and she's got tan skin. Her hands are all, and, and she's a working woman. Pedicure not happening. Medi medicure. <laughs> well, we need to work on that too. Pedicure, whatever these things call, whatever they call them, I don't know. Uh, my, my wife likes those too. Getting her nails done. I mean, she does not have it all together. She's out there working hard, all right? And, and she says, they made me the keeper of the vineyards. Now, now, this is the actual vineyard. Now she's talking about the vineyard of herself. But my own vineyard, I have not kept. In other words, my own body. I have not, just, I have not kept up with it like I would like to because I'm busy working. Can I hear an amen from the women? Can I hear, oh, no, from the men? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Tell me, you whom my soul loves... Where your pasture, your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like the one who veils herself besides the flocks of your companions? Now, what she's saying is, is why should I dress like a veiled woman? You know what a veiled woman is? A prostitute. She's saying, why should I walk around flaunting my body in a way that would bring sexual attention to myself? I'm not saying she's not dressing nice. I'm saying, why should I draw people to look at me as a sexual object instead of a person? And let me tell you something, young ladies, and I'll tell you the men too. You can dress in a way that will, will, will make it difficult for people not to see you more than a sexual object. Now, I'm not one of these folks where you're going to have to have a dress down to your ankles and you have to put a Pentecostal bun. You know what a Pentecostal bun is? I call it bondage. Where you put, you tighten your hair. Okay. And we're not talking about that. I'm talking about dressing in a way that would basically, there's some people out there, they're, they're perverted. No matter what you do, they'll be perverted. But I'm talking drawing attention to yourself sexually by wearing outfits that are creating that aspect or talking that way or doing things or flirting or, or doing things that are all sexual, trying to arouse somebody. Instead of that, getting them to know who you are, you're putting on the airs, okay? She's saying, I'm not that way. Tell me whom you love, my soul, where your pastor, your flocks, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one of those who veils herself? Ladies and, and people, why should we be like the world that prostitutes themselves, that makes the physical more important than the emotional and the spiritual? Why emphasize something that's really more exclusive? It's exclusive for marriage. That's what she goes on for herself. So, being more attractive number one thing to be more attractive I'm not just saying because I'm a pastor I'm saying because it's the truth is spiritual attraction why would I say that I'll tell you why what lives forever your what spirit why not invest in what lasts forever your spirit Jesus said this out of your innermost being will flow out of your spirit will flow rivers of living water right and so what we want to happen is I want our attraction of my life to be from the spirit of God in me that flows to the rest of me let me tell you something. I have found this through being in the ministry a number of years. My dad even told me this. He says, be careful when you become a pastor because a lot of women, a lot of women don't have husbands that are spiritual. And so if you listen to these women and talk to them, they're going to like you because you're spiritual, not because you're good at good looking. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but seriously, and, and let me tell you something. I've heard women say this all the time. When my husband's spiritual, they find you attractive. And so guys, you know, instead of being in church like this, Oh, Jesus, you know, 
everything I need right now. Guys, get your hands in the air. You know, hold a TV set, all right? My fish is this big, okay? Goal post, <laughs> lifting up holy hands. The Bible says, I, men, I tell men everywhere, lifting up holy hands. What's the deal with that? It's just saying, God, I love you. Men, women love guys that are spiritual. You know, guys are supposed to be the spiritual head of the house. And when that begins to happen, all the cylinders and the ladies go, whoa, he's my spiritual leader. I love this. It's something. Can I hear an amen, ladies? Amen. Hey, wow. Yeah, I, didn't have, I didn't have to turn that one up. They're ready to go. Men sometimes are unseen in church. Men, we should be the leaders in church. We should show the women, right? We should help lead in church. The women do a better job in church than a lot of the men do. We should work together, not competing, but working together in concert. And the men haven't done their job. When the women and men come together, wow, it's a force to be reckoned with. If we have spiritual attraction, it's the most important thing in a relationship. And how does it happen? Well, love and honors God. Do, do you love and honor God? Do the person you're interested love and honor God with their money, with their time? How do they treat each other? This is why it's important, by the way, uh, young ladies, how does, uh, how does he treat his mom? Now, some of them never get rid of mom, and that could be a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you're like, you can get rid of your mom. You know, the Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two should become one flesh. Okay. Some guys never leave their moms, and, and they're always play second fiddle. That ain't right. When you're married to your wife, she should be the first, not the second. However, how a man treats his mother will very much be what how he'll treat you and vice versa how does the guy treat his mother is he disrespectful does he not care comes in the house Rah! just throw in my mom do everything well guess what's going to happen to you same thing and, and this is what i've learned also i know this sounds kind of bad but it's true whatever you see before marriage exaggerate when you get you'll see when you get married whatever you see before marriage exaggerate if he can see if she's a complainer before you're married, forget about when you get married. All right? Listen, now's the time to, to, to parse it out. Don't wait till you get married. Find these things now. And, and, and date long enough where you get to see the flaws. Date long enough where the endorphins of a new relationship get down to normal and you can start seeing the real person. But if you're involved with the physical and everything else, you can't know the real person, can you? You'll be intoxicated by romance instead of knowing the person. And so love that honors God. Do they honor God? Do they worship God? Here's another one that's important. Connected to your God-given purpose. Why are you on the planet for? And I'll tell you, I encourage you to get involved here at the church. Serve together. Serve in a nursery. Serve in a youth group. Serve having a small group. Listen, try having an argument. Within 25 minutes, you got people coming to your house. You got to make up quick. I'm telling you, being a pastor, that one of the fringe benefits of being a pastor is I can't get up here and lie to you. I can, but I don't want to. My kids will tell you, right? I want to make up with my wife before I get up here, so I want to make sure. Saturday night, they repentance every week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we work at it. There was a time, I mean, one time I, I came in on Wednesday night, and we had Wednesday night, and I, I had a start. I said, I need to apologize to my wife. I was a jerk today to my wife. And, you know, I can be a jerk sometimes. She's never that way, but I can be. But what happens is you have a God-given purpose together. You want to make up, right? So connected to your God-given purpose, what are you guys doing for the kingdom? And church is a great way to start. We get to serve each other and serve the community and the God, people that God sends us. How about this? Has godly standards. Has godly standards. Do they have godly standards of how they live? Well, if you really love me, girl, you'll take me to the, you know, we should get together. Well, you know what? If that's what it takes for me to keep you, you're the wrong person. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you can't touch this until there's a ring on it. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. And let me say something else about this. You have to make the decision physically of where you're going to draw the line prior to getting involved in a relationship. Why? Because if you're in the middle of it, you're going to go to bed. What? How can you say that? Well, I can tell. The Bible says flee from sexual immorality. It doesn't say walk. It says flee. Why? Because it will grab you. And it, it, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. 
You see, sex within marriage is a wonderful bonding experience. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. Tremendous. But it can also be very destructive. The enemy understands that. You become one flesh with somebody, you tear it away. One flesh, tear it away. One flesh, tear it away. You do it with a bunch of people, you got a broken person inside, everybody. And so God wants to stop that from happening for your own good. So you have to make a decision ahead of time. We're not going to go there. We're going to stop with holding that, whatever. We're, gonna not, we're not going to do things that are reserved for marriage. My wife and I made a rule. If people can't be around us, we're not going to be doing it, engaging in activity. Not now, of course. I'm probably before we got married. Okay? We made a decision, and I will, I will happily tell you that my children, you guys could be around us every time we were dating. We were respectful to each other. We did not do anything. We did not have sex before we were married. We treated each other with respect. We didn't go crazy. We didn't act silly. We were respectful each other, each other, of each other, and we reserved ourselves for marriage. Let me tell you, that's the right way to do it. Okay? So have godly standards. So young man, get your hands off of her. <laughs> young lady, don't let him touch you. I'm serious. Get off of me. Slap him if you have to. I'm serious. Don't, don't, I, I'm telling you the truth. Don't allow this nonsense to take place. Slap him. Okay. Well, if you have to, you have to, young ladies. I'm serious. Do not give yourself away like that. You are more valuable than that. If that's all they want, you don't need them. Thank you. That's some good preaching, everybody. Come on. I can say that because I'm a father. Being more attractive, spiritual attraction, very important, most important, because it lasts forever. The second thing of attraction is emotional attraction. Emotional attraction is important. What, what's that all about? Well, you are, you are as exciting my darling oh my darling oh my okay you are as exciting my darling as a mare among pharaoh's stallions a, a, a horse you are a white horse pharaoh had a great fleet a great fleet a great uh, bunch of horses and the beautiful horses pharaoh had would be white and they pull his chariot you are the finest of them you are my darling. And, and the Hebrew word for darling, uh, Hebrew, I'm not going to try to say it, basically says, you're like my friend. You're my best friend. And I will say, Sandra and I, we were friends for two and a half years before we got married. She's my best friend. She carried my wallet. We shared desserts. And I'm a germaphobe, okay? And we used to call each other every day. and say, how you doing? She used to talk to me. I used to talk to her. Bah, bah, bah. I was very, very, very careful. Because I was a, I was assistant pastor, I didn't want to date someone in the church, and I made sure I'm not going to give my heart away until it's the right one. I had it right here. I was a little little too much with it, but I was like, no, I ain't giving it away until it's the right time. And so you are, except my darling, as a mare among pharaohs. To how lovely are your cheeks, your earrings set them afire. How lovely is your neck enhanced by a string of jewels. So it's okay to buy jewelry, guys. See, the ladies are like it. Okay. We will make for you earrings of gold and beads of silver. The king is lying on his couch enchanted by the fragrance of my perfume. Okay? So he loves her, but he loves her also because they are friends. They enjoy each other. Do you enjoy your spouse? Do you have any activities you can do together? Guys, is like, oh, gosh, I'm home. I'll hit the golf course and do, do 18 holes. What about the hole in your wife's heart? Ah, that's okay. I'm going to hang out with the guy. How about the gals? Well, I'm going to go to the coffee shop and talk to my ladies. I'm not saying guys don't go to coffee shops. I'm just, I'm just basically saying, are you spending more time with that? Is your best friend your spouse? You should have a, your, your best friend should be your spouse. And, you know, it's one of the beauties of, of kids going to school. My wife and I, we have Mondays. That's our day. We go out. We, we go to some coffee shop someplace. Yeah, I like coffee. See, I'm the feminine one. I'm just kidding. I go to a coffee shop. We have a cool coffee together. We hang out. We go for long walks. We talk. It's nothing we're not we're not talking about we're talking about friendship here guys friendship it's not just about oh i want to get mine no it's about friendship we spend time we enjoy we laugh we have a good time we enjoy we go to costco and have samples together okay <laughs> yeah that's that's a cheap date by the way <laughs> keep going to the same meatball place okay but what i'm trying to say is enjoy do something maybe cross-country ski play whatever hike 
find something you both can do, you both enjoy, where you can develop your relationship. Sometimes we like to just hang out in bed. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm saying we'll sit in bed and we'll watch Tiny House Hunters so we feel good about our house. I'm just kidding. We're, we're very happy with our house. But we just enjoy hanging out and just chilling out and having a good time. And it's important to develop that relationship. You know, when we develop our relationship, everything else gets better, including the other thing, guys. Okay. My lover is like a, this is my, my lover is like a sachet of myrrh lying between my breasts. Now, I don't know what a sachet of myrrh is, but I'm sure he was glad he was one of them. You guys are embarrassed. Let, let me explain. It doesn't mean what you think of it, by the way. A sachet of myrrh basically was this. It was something that she would think about. She would smell it, like a, or something between here, and she'd smell it, and she would think about it. Does your spouse, or does the lover of your life have, does it make him think, oh, I can't wait to see her. I can't wait to see him. There's a thinking process about it. Oh, the, the fragrance of your relationship is just so beautiful. I think about it when I go to sleep. I think about it when I wake up. Remember that, guys and girls? Remember that? Yeah, okay. And some of you are in the middle of it. All right. He's like a bouquet of sweet henna blossom, these red flowers, from the vineyards of En Gedi. So you want to work on be a friend. Make sure you work on your friendship, everybody. That's important. If it's all about the kids, let, let me say something. It wasn't in my notes. I'm going to say it anyhow. The most important thing, this is the order of marriage. God, your spouse, then your kids. It's not God, kids, and spouse. Because the kids are going to get out, and you're going to be stuck with your spouse. And if you haven't spent time with your spouse, you're like, who are you? Okay? And let me say something else. The best thing that a father can do for his kids is to love his mother. And the best thing a mother can do for the kids is to love her husband because that brings security in the house. I love sometimes when we, sometimes when we hug, my wife and I, I'm going to put him on the spot, uh, my youngest will run up and he gets a little excited. He wants to get in the middle of the hug. You know, they love to see mom and dad loving each other. And by the way, when you mess up, which I do too, apologize to your children for how you treated your spouse. Say, I didn't treat your mom right. I was wrong. I do that all the time, <laughs> every day. Okay, so, a friend, not harsh words. Guys, we struggle with this. Guys, we, we're, guys are quick to say stuff. I didn't mean it, I just said it. We say it and forget about it. We're like a Snapchat, guys. If you don't know what Snapchat is, you write, it, you write something on the internet, it disappears. We think, you no, know, words stick with women. They're like Facebook, and they share it, and they go over it. They're not Snapchat. Okay, so not harsh words. And, uh, and you know what I hate to hear, and I spouses do this, when you make fun of your spouse to somebody else. Ah, oh, my wife, she's, she burns the meals. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, my husband, he can't hold a job. Ah. <laughs> you know how that makes the man feel? It's horrible. Don't do that. Not harsh words. You know, they, they did studies on this. This is true. Um, and this is what they found. They found that couples that speak poorly to each other have a higher rate of divorce than those that speak nice to each other. And it's hard, but you not harsh words. You know what? If you don't speak nice to your spouse, somebody else will. Especially in the workplace. Sally, that was an incredible thing you did. That presentation, that sales presentation, what you did in the office, off the charts. You're like my, you're my work wife. Please don't ever say you're my work wife or work husband because that kind of gives a connotation that you find them like someone you'd marry. I'm just joking. Yeah, you know what joking does? Joking is like, is like Novocaine. It makes it easier to do something because you don't feel it. Don't mess around that way. It's a right to compliment, man. You, you are drop dead gorgeous. It's a good thing I'm not married because, man, I'd be, don't say stuff like that. Don't say stuff like that. Well, this is what I think. Well, if you think it, your thinking's wrong. Listen, we don't listen to our emotions. Our emotions listen to us. And so, my friends, love is a decision, not a feeling. Feelings come after. And so be very careful not the harsh words. So be careful how you speak to each other. What are you filling the emotional tanks with? We all run on something. Men generally run 
uh, and this comes from the book Love and Respect, by the way. Great book. I read it, and I highly recommend it. I'm not going to teach it right now, but one of the major things it says from Ephesians 5 is that men like respect. All you have to do is go to the inner city and go to the police station and ask them, why did this guy shoot this guy? Why did this guy beat the other person up? Well, they said he didn't respect me. You hear it all the time in the street. It's respect, respect. Respect is huge for guys. Respect means what I do and how I do it. And so if you tell a man, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good, you stink at that, you can't provide for your own family, why can't you be like the other husbands that can put up curtain rods? I don't know. Okay. What, what are you feeling? You know, man, you just, you just, you did a great job. Thank you so much. The way you played with the kids today, the way you did this, the way you did the dishes, the way you provide for the family. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for coming home every week. Thank you that, you know what, you bring a paycheck home. I want to thank you for being my support. Da, da, da. Say nice things about that. You know what a man does? Man feels good when he's respected. And when a man feels respected, he wants to show love. And what do women normally need? Woman needs love. Guys don't care how they look. I mean, I come home, my wife says, you know, wow, that's quite an outfit. You look really good. Your hair looks great. I couldn't care less how my hair looks. I'm like, here I am, you know. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, a woman's like, you know, she could be the most drop-dead woman in the world, but she sees one speck. Oh, there's something wrong with me, right? Guys don't care, obviously. You can see, <laughs> you, go to a men's, you go to a men's section, a shoe section, they have like two pairs of shoes. You go to a woman's section, you go to a clothing store for women, you guys have more clothes. Go to a men's section, what do you have? T-shirt, black shirt, white shirt, working boots, boom, that's it. We're easy. I buy all my stuff at Costco. Okay, here we go. I get, every time I say Costco, $200. What are you feeling? I'm almost like the, I'm almost like the president endorsing. No, I'm going to stop. I didn't say that. What are you feeling the emotional tanks for each other with? Men's tank, respect. Woman's tank is love. If you don't feel it, somebody else will. I'm going to tell you right now. So we have a friend, not harsh words, and it takes captive every thought. Wow. She likes me. She finds me attractive. I hadn't been told in years that I'm attractive. I feel like I'm back in high school again. And let me say something about this. This is not in my notes. I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe the Holy Spirit's prompting me. Watch out for high school reunions. Watch out for Facebook reacquaintances. Oh, my first girlfriend. I found her on Facebook. Especially for those of the, the, the young kids don't use Facebook, but for the rest of us, Facebook. Oh, how are you doing? Oh, you look great. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, I'm flying in the area on business. Let's get coffee. Oh, no way. Don't do it. Don't entertain that. Because what's going to happen, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be transported back when you're 17 again. I've seen this happen more times than I'd like to say. Facebook romances do not do it have your spouse to be able to see your facebook your snapchat your twitter whatever the witter whatever you got out there i don't care but take captive every thought i find her attractive so what i find him attractive so what that's your emotions you're responding to the stimuli big deal Get over yourself. You're going to be tempted occasionally. I'm tempted to eat things I shouldn't eat. I'm tempted to get angry at people I should get angry at. Do I give in to it? No, I know better. I know that those, those decisions will cause me trouble. Well, just like you don't yell at people and do things that are wrong sexually and don't be flirting. Take every thought captive. Guys, we don't need to be looking at stuff online that no one can do. These airbrushed women are not even real. Fantasy. Don't get your mind filled with that junk. It will ruin you. It's not freedom, it's bondage. Even secular sociologists and psychologists are saying, and even Time Magazine had, an, had a big article on it about last year about the toxicity and the chemical, the neural problems associated with pornography. It, this is a big issue. It's all over our society. Take caps thoughted. Take captive every thought. Get, include other people to help you with it. Have brothers and friends. How's your thought life? What are you doing on your, on your Facebook account? What's on your text? Your phone should not be locked from your spouse. If it is, there's a problem. I'd demand it if I were you. 
<laughs> oh, and I said, no, you know what? We're one flesh here. I need to see what's on your phone. I need to see what's on your computer. Let me have your password. What? Listen, folks, we got to live transparently. I mean, I'm, I mean, I don't know how I grew up today. Uh, when I was a kid, it was hard to be bad. Now it's so easy. Take captive every thought. Relationships are, let me share with you what relationships are. They are, I, we believe, and I believe this from other people that I've read some books and, and other studies, spiritual, 75% of our relationship, of healthy relationships are spiritual, according to the Word of God. And I believe that to be true based upon what we can see. 75% spiritual, emotional, 20%. If you get this right, everything else takes care of itself. Let me tell you right now, if I love God, I'm going to love my wife better. If I love God, I'm going to love my kids better. If I love God, I'm going to love you better. I'm better if I love God first. That's the answer, everybody. And so spiritual is number one. Number two is emotional. And sexual intimacy, 5%. What? 5%? Well, let me say something. If this 5% is messed up, it's almost 100%. Let me say that again. If this is messed up, it affects, it, it becomes more important. But in its proper context, it's 5%. How can you say that? Well, it is 5%. It's like a little cinnamon in, in cooking. You put a little bit of cinnamon, it makes the whole dish taste a whole lot better. Like a little yeast goes everywhere. That's how sexual intimacy is. It's important. We're going to have a whole topic on this, the PG-13 section. We're going to be talking about this, how to have good intimacy in relationship with your spouse. We're actually going to talk about that in church. Why? Because the world is telling you wrong stuff. What you see in movies, what you see in television, these crazy movies that are out right now about destructive sexual behavior is not the way to go, friends. So we're going to talk about it. It's going to be some hot love. All right. How beautiful you are, my darling. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way back. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful your eyes are like doves. In the rabbinic understanding, a, a person's eyes were the windows of their souls. If you want to know someone, you look at their eyes. And you'd see deep with them who they are. Your eyes are like doves. You're so handsome, my love, pleasing beyond words. The soft grass is our bed. Fragrant cedar branches are the beams of our house. And pleasant smelling furs are the rafters. So now we're talking about the physical attraction. Here we go to the five percent. That if it's not right, it's like hundred percent. Let me say that. Again. Let me say that again. If the five percent ain't right, it becomes hundred percent of a problem in a marriage. I'm not making this stuff up. I, this is what Christian psychologists and Gary Smalley and other people I've read about talk about. Okay, physical attraction. How does this work? I am the rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. He's beautiful. I love my husband, right? I love my man. She's not married yet. Sustain me with raisins. Refresh me with apples. Apparently, raisins were like an aphrodisiac. We eat a lot of raisins in our house. <laughs> Sustain me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. You know what I'm talking about? You know, oh, I'm so sick with love. I love it. Okay, I'm sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Uh-oh. Yep. I adore you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles. He's dear again. Or, or, or the does of the field that you do not stir up. Or awake in love. Wait a minute, we're getting too far here. Let's stop. That's what happened. They were going too far. We gotta stop this. Let's not awaken this thing until it's the right time. All right? Not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Until the right time. What's the right time? Get a ring on it. Get married. Don't be having sex. Let me just say it flat out. Don't have sex before you get married. And if you're doing that, stop it. How do I stop it? Well, you can if you make a decision. Why? Do it God's way. They get married for crying out loud. Why? It's not good for you. God wants to bless you, everybody. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. It's not up to me. Not stir up love or waking love till it finds its time. Promise me, old woman of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and the deer. Here we go again, the deer and the gazelles. 
not to awaken love until the time is right. Young people, don't waken up love to the wrong time. And don't give your heart away to anybody. I'm not talking about sex. I'm just talking about intimacy and falling in love. It stinks to fall in love and break up and have your heart trampled on. It's, why should a 17-year-old child or 14-year-old child go through that pain? Be friends. You're not going to get married for a while. Why waste your heart? You can still like somebody, but keep it friendship. Keep it in groups. Let me tell you, I'm telling you this for your own good, not because I want to hurt anybody. And then when the right one comes... Your heart's not going to be all shattered and broken. Okay, now that's between you and God how you work it out. The Bible is very clear about intimacy. So promise me, O woman of Jerusalem, do not awaken love until the timing is right. So I want to encourage, let's bow our heads if we could. Father, I want to thank you so much for you are the way, you're the truth, and you are the life. Father, I thank you, you are the way. And Lord, I pray for some of us right now and, and all of us in this room have, are not acting in the proper way. None of us are perfect in our relationships. And Father, we declare today we're going to make your way our way with your help. Father, I pray for those that are involved in relationships right now. They're dating. They're involved. The, whatever they're doing with someone else there, and, and it's not right. Well, Lord, we, we realize we're, we're hurting ourselves. We want to do it your way. And so Father, we choose your way. And you are the truth. We, your way, and we're going to live your truth, and you will give us the life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, forgive us for going the wrong way. I just pray right now that you would restore marriages for everyone watching online right now, live or later, and those here right now. Lord, we just pray that marriages would be restored in this house. Father, that our teenagers and young people would be pure they would be examples of integrity in the high schools and junior highs. Father, in colleges and young adult circles, Lord God, that they would encourage each other. They would encourage proper relationships to help them to become all that you've become. Father, we want to thank you for, for love between husband and wife, the beautiful romance that's there. We're asking that we'd experience it in the proper context of what you created to be so we could be healthy and happy the way you created us to be. So Lord, I pray right now for those that are struggling with their physical aspects of their marriage. I pray for healing in that area, the intimacy. I pray for healing of the emotional, the friendship. I pray that we restore friendships in this place. We know that friendships are not restored without forgiveness. We'd forgive each other quickly. And Father, I pray for the spiritual, the most important, that we would make it our priority to make sure that we're first with you in Jesus' name. And with every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question right now. The question is this, how are you with God? Have you given your life to God? And those watching online right now, Facebook or our platform, are you right with God? Are you right with God right now? If you were to die right now, are you absolutely positive you'd be with Him in heaven? Well, I'm pretty good compared to everyone else. And that's not good enough. You've got to be perfect. And none of us are perfect without the blood of Jesus Christ who takes away our sins. He takes away our past, cleanses us, and gives us hope for a new future. Have you given your life to Jesus? Maybe you've walked away and you knew better. But you wanted to have this relationship. I want to have this relationship. I know it's wrong, but let me push God away for a while. And you realize you've been compromising way too much and you've fallen from God. Maybe now's your time to get right with Him. So with every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question. If you want to give your life to God for the first time or get right with Him again because you've walked away, on the count of three, we're going to ask you to raise your hand real quick. And even online, you can click online. One, two, three. Real quick, anyone say, I want to get right with God. Anyone here this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It takes courage to do that. You can put your hands down. There is a, a connection card. I don't have it in front of me. You have a connection card, honey? All right. The connection card. In the card, it says, I made a decision for Jesus today. If you could fill that out, everybody, so we can keep, we want to help you grow forward, okay? That's what we're going to do. And so let's just pray right now. I'm going to pre repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I give my life 
to you for the first time, oh, I recommit my life to you. I recognize you have not been first place. I today have made a decision that you are my God and I will follow you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Maybe you want to confess some of those sins right now. The sins that I'm aware of. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose, with your help, to walk with you all the days of my life. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Listen, that's what I want to encourage you. We're going to continue to worship God with our giving. You want to prepare yourself to give. We are going to have growth track today. I know it's late, but we're here anyhow. We have a full lunch for you, growth track, step Step two, it's all about connecting to the church. What do we believe, what we're about? How can you get connected with your spouse at church? Find out today. We have a great lunch. Also, we want to encourage you. Go ahead, guys and gals. Uh, we also want to encourage you to sign up for small groups. Let's not do this alone, everybody. Let's work together in Jesus' name. Lord, bless this offering in Jesus' name. You see the different ways you can give. Let's go ahead and do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A couple of things I want to tell you also about what's happening. Um, next week is growth track number three, finding your gifts. But I want to encourage you, we're starting, we're starting small groups this week. Would you invest in it? If you don't like it, you don't have to go back. But give it a shot. And if there's nothing available, then just say, I, this is the time I'd like to meet. And we'll try to find a way to get you to hook up. The hook up. We're trying to find a way for you to get connected, okay? And that's what we're going to do. And so that's what it's all about. We want to get connected and make a difference together. We're going to ask our prayer team to come up. We want to have everyone stand. If you want prayer for anything at all, we want to pray for you. We believe that God answers prayers, and sometimes you need someone to join in with you and say, will you pray with me about the situation?